Hi, everyone. Sorry about that. Um, my name is Andrew Nudigert. Uh, I work for a company called GitLab. Um, maybe you heard of them. Um, and I'm an engineer there. I work in the infrastructure team. So we basically manage GitLab.com and uh, keep it running, or try to keep it running, at least. Um, and today, I'm going to be talking to you about capacity planning and resource management. And so the first question people always ask is, like, what's the point? We're running in the cloud. Like, everything scales perfectly. Like, there's no need to, to, to worry about this. Uh, you just turn on auto scaling, and everything just will take care of itself, right? The, the problem is that in any sufficiently large system, there's always going to be bottlenecks, and there's always going to be hotspots that can't scale linearly like the rest of your system. Um, and um, some of these bottlenecks might be due to legacy code, but uh, some of them might also be inadvertently introduced in, in new features that you're adding to your product. Um, and very often, these bottlenecks reside inside uh, what we call pet services, but often they often also occur inside cattle. So before we go into like, capacity planning, I'm going to spend some time discussing some examples of resource saturation so that we can understand why capacity planning is important. So resource saturation is one of those phenomena that translates really well into the real world and as well as into the world of software. Um, you see many examples of it in, in the real world, so let's take a look at one of those examples first. Um, I'm going to start off with um, something that we've all experienced, and that's gridlock traffic. So one way to explain gridlock traffic would be to say that the number of cars in the traffic system exceeds the available capacity of the traffic system for some reason, and then it gets up to a point where it's so saturated that even the junctions are blocked with cars. And then in, when this happens, in the worst cases, every vehicle is effectively blocking every other vehicle from accessing the system because there's loops um, where one car is indirectly blocking another probably around a block. And this occurs in, in much the same way as we see deadlock in, in complex software systems. And when this deadlock occurs, it's very different from normal heavy traffic, right? So in heavy traffic, you might get slowed down, but you're still moving. And cars obey the lights, and pedestrians cross on the green man, at least in some cities. Um, and, uh, but in gridlock, like, everything totally breaks down, and it's chaos. You could be stuck for hours. Cars could be blocked in junctions, there's pedestrians weaving through the traffic, it's total chaos and it's a very different experience from sort of heavy traffic. So from that example, I'm going to move on to an example of resource saturation that we saw on, on GitLab.com. And this incident happened in July this year and we've got a, um, the, the production issue from, from when it occurred and then we had a, a, an RCA, which is like a post-mortem but a... I forgot what, post, what RCA stands for, but it's basically a post-mortem without mentioning dead people. So, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so those are the issues that they're public, like most things on GitLab.com. Um, so it all started with this graph, and this is the AppDeck score of our web service. So the higher it is, the better. And, like, you can't really see it on the screen, but there's a red line across the top there. And that's the SLO for this metric. So when we, sort of, when, our, when we sort of go below that red line, that's when we were in trouble. And we were like well below that red line. And so we were in a lot of trouble. And so we started seeing major slowdowns on our web endpoints. And then our API fleet started slowing down. And then requests started queuing on unicorn workers. And we started having lots and lots of side effects. And things were in a really bad state. And so we went through the, the normal checklist of usual suspects to look out for when you get into that sort of situation. And the first thing we, we looked out for was, is there an application change? Is there something that's just been rolled into production that's causing everything to fail? Um, and it didn't seem to be the case. And so the next candidates is obviously, are there any infrastructure changes? Have we done anything to our infrastructure that's caused this? And there had been nothing. Um, and so the, the, the third thing we always jump to, actually the third thing we always jump to is probably the cloud, but I think in this case we didn't, we didn't blame our cloud provider. Um, but it wasn't that. And then we looked, is it bad people? Is it someone doing abuse? Is it someone who's written a bot to sort of push to GitLab 50 times a second and they've deployed it across the entire fleet? Um, and it didn't seem that way either. So clearly something had changed 
Um, and we were receiving all of these error alerts and latency alerts across the whole system, but it wasn't the usual sort of problems. And eventually, we narrowed the problem down to our Redis uh, caching fleet. Um, and so this fleet runs on N1 standard four uh, Google Cloud uh, machines. And so they've got four cores on them. And three of the cores on these machines were sitting idle. And one of them was pinned at 100%, just totally like pinned. And Redis was sitting there, pinned on there. Um, so you can, as you may know, Redis is a, is a single-threaded application. And this means that on a Redis server, you can only scale as much as you can scale on a single core. And it doesn't really matter how big your fleet is, you will only be able to scale as, as, as much as you can on that single core. And sure, you can shard your, your application horizontally, um, or you can migrate to Redis cluster, or there's a whole bunch of other solutions. Um, but these changes require testing, and they're not something you can do immediately. These are sort of longer term changes. Um, and so, and they're not things that we wanted to do during a, a, a degradation. And so it's also worth noting that we did have average CPU alerts across this fleet, but the average CPU on these boxes was actually very low. It was about 30%, because we had three cores that were sitting there idle, and one core that was, was pinned at the top. Um, so if you've run out of CPU, the obvious fix is to just get more CPU, right? And just get a faster machine. And so we looked at the boxes and we realized that they were actually running uh, Intel Haswell processors. So we're like, ha we have a solution. We'll just upgrade to Skylake and that'll fix everything. Well, it turns out that uh, in our benchmarking, the Skylake uh, processors were no faster for that uh, workload, for the Redis workload that we were doing. So there was actually no point in upgrading. Um, and uh, so what we ended up having to do was make a whole bunch of small application changes to fix hotspots in the code and badly performing code. But this isn't ideal when you've got PagerDuty sort of pinging you every two minutes, making a big noise and, and putting you under pressure. Um, so we did manage to fix the problem, but it wasn't a, a, a great, um, it, you know, the turnaround time was, was pretty bad. So let's consider the takeaways from this incident. So the, the, our job, as an inf or my job as an infrastructure engineer is way more fun if I can avoid these situations in the first place uh, rather than bumble into them and then try to fix them when they're already underway. Um, and the mean time to recovery on these saturation issues is often very high because you can't have a quick fix where you reverse a single change and everything goes back to how it was before. Um, and the worst news is that there are often many different potential bottlenecks in your system, and we need to avoid saturation on all of them in order to keep the system running. So I've listed a few of them here. We've got CPU, memory, those are obvious ones, and, and as you move into a world of Kubernetes, those are less important. Um, but there are many other ones as well. There's, there's IOPS, there's disk throughput, there's database pool sizes, Redis, uh, Redis uh, client uh, um, pools, lots and lots of different things that we really want to avoid saturation on. So, uh, oh, yes, and then uh, finally, there's, uh, in these examples, this is something that I noticed, in real life saturation um, issues, but also in, in software ones, what we see is that resource saturation, when it occurs, failure isn't linear, right? So you can be sort of just underneath a, a saturation threshold and everything will be working perfectly and then you just go up a tiny bit more and everything fails really, really badly and very quickly. Um, and this is what we call passing a tipping point. So on the one side, everything's fine. On the other side, it's not good at all. And so resource saturation is, uh, in one system often leads to adjacent systems also failing. And so we have this chain reaction of, of systems failing. So we saw you know, web, API, we even saw latency on Postgres uh, which has nothing to do with Redis, but because uh, database transactions were being held open for longer, you know, it affected those systems as well. Um, and so in the worst case, this could affect your entire application. It could cause an outage across your, your entire site, which is very bad. Um, so with this in mind, we started thinking about what we could do to build an early, an early warning system that would help us predict and avoid these resource saturation issues before they become a problem. So the first step to avoiding resource saturation 
is to, is to measure it. And once you can measure it, you can forecast it. And then once you can forecast it, you can plan accordingly and make sure that it doesn't happen in the first place. Um, and so I used this photo because uh, for those of you who were in Cape Town last year, we were all intensely aware of the, of the water crisis um, at, that we were experiencing at the time. And one of the reasons why we managed to avoid day zero is because we could distill a whole lot of really critical information down into a small set of key metrics. And then everyone in the city used these metrics to plan accordingly and, and make sure that we could avoid this crisis. Um, and so obviously, you know, the example that we use here is we took the, the dam levels and we turned that into a percentage and everyone in the city was aware of, of, of what the percentage was of the, on, the, on the dam levels. Uh, and everyone wanted it to avoid going much further than that, or at least uh, much lower. Um, so we are also going to measure saturation as a percentage for, for all of our metrics. So zero is really, really good or unsaturated, and 100% is, is really bad and totally saturated. Um, and although we'll talk about it as a, as a percentage, we actually uh, store it in, the, in Prometheus as a ratio between uh, zero and one. So saturation is pretty straightforward to understand. For any given resource, what is the percentage um, of the maximum possible utilization of that resource that we're currently consuming? So for example, if we have 100 gigabytes of RAM and we're consuming 80 gigabytes of RAM, then we have a saturation of 80% or a ratio of, of, of 0 0.8. Um, so before I go any further, how many people here actually use Prometheus or have used it? Okay, cool, that's great, because it's, it's quite a Prometheus heavy talk from here on out. <laughs> um, cool, so the, the, as I said, there's, uh, what we want to do is we want to have like multiple saturation me uh, metrics that we want to track. Um, and for each of these saturation metrics, what we're going to do is create a recording rule in Prometheus. And this recording rule is called service component saturation ratio. It's not a great name, but it's kind of sticking to the Prometheus naming convention for recording rules. Um, and it's got two fixed dimensions. Um, so we want to aggregate all of our measurements up to a service level so that we know which services are going to be affected by a particular saturation metric. And then we also want to know the components, which is the type of resource that, that we are measuring. So that could be CPU, memory, database, all the other things that I mentioned earlier. So the next thing that we need to do in Prometheus is we add a recording rule for each of these uh, resources that we're tracking. So some of the examples that, I, uh, that we're currently tracking on GitLab.com is unicorn workers, um, percentage disk utilized, obviously CPU. Then we have another one called single node CPU, which tracks hotspots within a particular cluster. So um, I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, and we have database pool sizes. Are we running out of, out of PG Bouncer slots? Um, and we have many others, and most of them are recorded at that link over there. Um, so this is an example of the type of recording rule that I'm talking about. And for this exact example, we're talking about recording the single core CPU. Um, and this is for tracking CPU utilization on a single core uh, of a service. So we're looking at the, the most utilized core within the fleet for that service. Um, and obviously, as I said before, we express it as a ratio between zero and one, zero being good and one or 100% being complete saturation. Um, and it's also worth noting in this example that in general, we try to aggregate uh, resources using the max aggregator. So often in Prometheus, you use average or quantiles. Generally, with resource saturation, we, we want to look at the worst, and so we use max. And so to give you, uh, to use the previous example about Redis CPU, um, the average CPU utilization in the cluster was great. It was 30%. But it wasn't the average that got us. It was the maximum. It was the one core that was pinned at 100%. And that's why with resource saturation, we tend to use max and not, and not average. So you'll see max quite a bit in the, in the PromQL. And this is just another example, just to give you a, 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 a second example. Um, this, is, this records open file descriptors. So on a Unix machine, you have a maximum number of file descriptors that a process can open. 
And uh, in uh, Prometheus, for free, it will tell you what that number is currently. And um, it's, you, know, you don't have to do anything. It's, it's, if you use the Prometheus client for, for Go, and I think for Ruby as well, um, and I'm sure some of the others, it, it will basically emit this, this metric. Um, so it's super easy to track. Um, and when, when you have a file descriptor leak, it causes loads and loads of problems. So, this, so rolling this out is really like a no-brainer. Like it's just, you should be doing it. Um, and so this is a recording rule. Again, it, the, the output of this is a value between 0 and 1 um, because it's a ratio. Um, and 0 is good, 1 is bad. Cool. Um, so once we start recording the resource saturation measurements um, for everything in the single metric, the, the service component saturation ratio, uh, and we have a common set of, of labels, you can see we've got the component label and the service label, um, then we can start applying the same alerting, the same forecasting techniques, and the same dashboards to lots and lots of different metrics. Um, so for each new resource that we add to the system, we can just reuse the same alerting rules. And the same we'll use the same forecasting, and we, ha we can do all of this without adding lots more complexity to the system. We just add another recording rule and sort of all the downstream components we get for free. And so at, at GitLab, we call these our key metrics. So these are common metrics that we apply to multiple services across our system, and we monitor and analyze with a single set of rules. Uh, we also have a single set of dashboards that we can, we can look at the key metrics across all of our services. Um, we are, our other key metrics, which are pretty common, are QPS, error ratio, and availability. Um, the key metrics um, provide like a very high level view into your system. So it's, it's like for making sure that everything's running on, on, at the top level, but you still want to have, you know, in detail metrics at a lower level. So you'll notice in these metrics that we don't monitor the health of like individual hosts or containers or anything very low down. This is a very high level metric that we want to sort of see the, the overall health of the system. And so that's why we aggregate everything up to the service level. Um, so now that we have uh, the saturation metrics, like let's drill down into, into one of them. And this is the Redis CPU saturation metric that, uh, that, that we spoke about from the incident that we spoke about earlier. And I've managed to get um, uh, from the beginning of May all the way through to when we hit saturation at the beginning of uh, July and then a little bit, I think it's until about mid-July. So that's, what, like 10 weeks. So it's quite a long period of time that we're talking about here. And so the solid line over there is a rolling seven-day average, and we tend, this is the, the trend for the metric. So when that's going up, the, the, the average is, is going up. When that's going down, things are getting better. Um, and what we see is in, in May, going through June, this is generally building up and up and up. Um, so it started at the beginning of May at 60%, and by the end of May, it was at 80%, and then it carried on up, and then we actually briefly hit saturation right at the end of, uh, right at the beginning of June, but that was associated with, a, with an abuse event, and so we actually, we didn't notice it. We, we managed to, to, to sort out the abuse, and we never went further, and so if we'd, if we'd be monitoring this properly at that moment, we probably could have done something at that time. And then after that, things tracked down a little bit. I don't know if it was summer holidays and everyone was chilling, but things went down, and then they started getting gradually worse again through June. And what's really interesting about this graph, which I think really kind of illustrates the, the tipping point effect, is that in that first circle on the left, um, we were, that was the week before we started experiencing problems. And at that moment, everything was totally fine. We were basically, Redis CPU was peaking at like 99%, and everything was, was totally hunky-dory. And then the week after, the average just went up a tiny bit further and like everything, like all the toys fell out the cot. Um, so it kind of really illustrates like how small the difference is and how you, you really want to avoid hitting that peak saturation. So the first thing that we can do now that we have these recording rules, recording all of these saturation metrics, is that we can start alerting on the immediate problem of, of saturation. So, I don't know if you can't really see it on this graph, but there's a, 
a line that we've put in there at 90%. And any time any of our saturation metrics exceed 90%, we'll get an alert. And so, you know, we would have, this is the same metric, we would have got those alerts in June, um, and we would have, again, got them in the week leading up to the incident, um, and we could, have, we could have made a plan. And the, the great thing about this, uh, this, this alert is that it's generalized. So it doesn't matter whether it's 90% saturation on your unicorn worker fleet or 90% CPU saturation, as is the case in this example. If it stays that way for five minutes, then we will get an alert, and it's something that we can look at. Um, and this is the recording rule that we use in, in Prometheus, or at least in Alert Manager, to do that. And it's, it's super simple, right? There's like not a lot of complexity to it. Um, what it says is that for any saturation metric with any service or any labels, um, if it exceeds 90% for more than five minutes, trigger alert. And the title of the alert will be the you know, Redis service uh, CPU component has a saturation level exceeding 90%. Um, and so instead of having like one alert for CPU and one for unicorn workers and one for memory, we just have a single alert that covers the entire system. And so it's really simple to kind of understand and comprehend and, and manage. Uh, but the whole point of this talk is, uh, is to get to the point where we do not get these alerts because these alerts are very bad, right? And the reason we don't get these alerts is because we've had sufficient warning that there's a bottleneck coming and this is going to hurt us and we need to make plans about it. Um, so what we really want, ideally, is for Prometheus to tell us like several weeks in advance that we are heading towards saturation and we really not, uh, need to start making plans. So those plans might be, hey, we're going to set up Redis cluster, you know, we're going to shard our Redis, we're going to move Sidekick onto its own Redis fleet, whatever it is, at least we've got some time to kind of prepare and figure out what we're doing and we, we're not caught uh, short. So just kind of starting with the basics here, the most basic type of forecasting that you can get really is, is what we call linear interpolation. Um, and with linear interpolation, you can just extend a linear growth curve um, forward in time and then you make predictions about what its future value is going to be. So that's like super straightforward. Um, and this approach does work well for certain types of saturation metrics. Um, obviously, anything that has like a constant linear growth works really well with this. Um, and in particular, disk utilization is often very easy to predict because it just tends to go in one direction. Um, and Prometheus has a built-in function for this called, uh, for doing linear predictions, it's called uh, uh, linear predict. Uh, and it's, it's very easy to, to use that in, in Prometheus. But the problem, really, with that approach is that our data isn't linear, right? And so this can lead to, like, really misleading results. So often with saturation metrics, they rise and fall with user traffic. Um, and so here's an example. I, I made this example up to try to get the data right. But in this case, we clearly have a situation where we are tending towards saturation, or we've actually reached saturation, but the trend, the linear growth, is actually trending slightly downwards, right? So I did this in Excel, so it is actually, it, it does work like that. And it's, it's, if we were using linear interpolation, it would say everything's fine, in fact, everything's actually getting better. And that's clearly not the case in, in this example. So clearly, linear interpolation isn't going to help us. So here's another example taking that same metric and comparing the linear interpolation prediction that we made with actual data. Um, so obviously the prediction was made seven periods before, so like one week before, and, and we use linear interpolation to try and figure out. And so the blue line is our saturation metric and the, the dotted red line is the, is the linear interpolation uh, with one week's data and it's, we extend it forward by a week. So, and, and then obviously we shift it on top so we can compare. Um, and so the, the prediction for the 14th, so, so to kind of explain it to you, this prediction here was made with the data from this point here. So we sort of shifted it across. And so you can see this is a terrible forecast. Like if this is what you were basing your business on, it would, it would be atrocious. We'd sort of be really provisioning really hard at that point, and then we'd be like, everything's fine, and it, it, it doesn't work very well. It basically just lags on the data, so we couldn't really use that. So 
at this point, we tried different techniques and sort of nothing was really working for us. So we sort of stepped back a little bit and we sort of tried to figure out what we were actually doing and, and uh, maybe that could help us. And so there's always a good reason to add this GIF into, <laughs> into any presentation. So really what we wanted here was like we didn't need a perfect prediction into the future, right? And to use a, a weather analogy, we don't need like a, a weather forecast that's going to tell us it's going to be 23 degrees next week. Like all we need is a hurricane warning, right? We just need to know like things are going, like are going to start going very badly for you and you need to start making plans. Um, and so with that in mind, we started thinking about like how we could uh, improve this, this prediction. Um, so if we were to, to just focus on the hurricane warning, right, or what we might say the worst case, we can come up with a, with a better prediction, but it's not a perfect prediction. It's only a prediction of the worst case scenario, right? And the way we do that is by uh, basically guessing this worst case based on the current trend. So what's happening to the data now? Which way is it growing? But then also the variance in the data. So the data could be sort of getting more variant. It could be sort of uh, moving further and further away from the mean. Um, and we will basically in include that in, in, our, in, our, in our calculation. And so if we take the standard deviation for the data and we, we add two standard deviations to our trend prediction, this is not super scientific, but it's what we used and, and that two might make sense as like 1.5 for your business or three, um, but two worked for us. And so we add two standard deviations to the trend prediction and that gives us like a good guess of what the worst saturation value that we might expect in future will be, right? So, so in our, we, we tend to use two weeks because it's a, it's a good balance between uh, accuracy and um, uh, you know, being able to, to accurately predict it and giving us enough time. And so if we use this calculation and it tells us, well, in all likelihood in two weeks time, your worst case scenario is gonna be like 50% saturation, this is not something we need to worry about. But if it says in two weeks' time, the likelihood is that you're going to be at 100% saturation, then this is something that we need to sit up and take notice of and start making plans for. Um, so I just put, again, that new model into, into Excel, and I came up with this calculation. So at first, it looks pretty bad as well. But actually, if you follow that line, we made the prediction about the saturation being really bad there at this point here. And so obviously after that it did drop down, but it was actually something that, the prediction was good, like it, it was the right place for the data to be. And then we do have these drops here which, which don't work so well, but those tend to happen when the, when the data drops very steeply, like it did in this case, so I'm not super worried. And then again we got another uh, alert about, about the actual value uh, trending up at the end there. Um, so the question is, can we implement this with Prometheus? And uh, the answer is, of course. So the first thing that we need is uh, we need to be able to track like the average, the rolling seven-day average for all of our metrics. So for CPU, for memory, for, for, for every service um, for a one-week period. And so from that, we can get a trend. Is the, is the data trending up or down? Um, and with Prometheus, this is something that's incredibly easy to do because, again, we can sort of apply the same recording rule across all of our metrics. So we only have to do it in one place and, and we'll, we'll get this recording rule for, for everything. And we do the same thing with, with the standard deviation over a week and that gives us our, our variance, like how much the data is, is moving. Um, so once we've got the seven-day rolling average, we can use that to do linear uh, prediction. And, and so we'll use a predict linear function that's built into PromQL, and we'll interpolate that uh, two weeks into the future. So that's just the linear uh, prediction algorithm is designed to talk in seconds. I don't think anyone is thinking about like two weeks in the future when they built it, but we use it and it works reasonably well. Um, and so now we have like a two week prediction on where the trend is gonna be. So going back to that original incident that we spoke about uh, from July with the Redis CPU, like what we can do is we can retrofit our model to that data and see how it would perform um, and, and you know, whether it would have given us the right signals. 
And so the, the yellow line is uh, the, the Redis CPU saturation, the same one as before. And then the blue line is, is the signal that we would be getting from our prediction algorithm to basically tell us uh, where, what it thinks the worst case of, of, of Redis is going to be. And actually, it performs pretty well. So it starts off low, it goes high, and at that point, we could have started making plans and, and uh, to avoid the situation. Um, there is, again, a weird drop there, but the thing is that, you know, this is not something that we, you know, it's a signal, and, and we get a bunch of these signals, and we can look at them and decide which ones are important. Um, and so, yeah. So, finally, once we've collected all of this data uh, across, across all of these different resources, across all of these services, what we need to do is come up with a way to query the data so that we know what the biggest potential bottlenecks in the system are. And so this is just a Prometheus query that you can run, and it will give you like all of the potential problems ranked from, from worst to least worst, and it will give you the top 10. Uh, and again, it's a very simple algorithm. Um, obviously, what you want to do is visualize that somehow. And so we, we query this in Grafana, and we've got the super Lumo um, bar graph. Um, and so this, I, I put this screenshot in yesterday, uh, and this was from our production system. Um, and you, there's no way you can read that, but that is our front-end service, which is HAProxy, um, and it's the single node CPU. And so what that was telling us, uh, for, for various reasons, our HAProxy fleet is not auto-scaled, uh, and what that was telling us is that HAProxy is going to run out of CPU in two weeks' time. And in that case, it was super easy. We went into Terraform. We changed the number of HAProxy nodes and committed it, and bosh, that's fixed. The next problem down is a PG Bouncer connection pool problem. And that's much more complicated for us to, to, to deal with, but we've got some, uh, we've, we've got some leeway to, to build something around that. And so having that signal is, is super important. This one is disk space on a Gitly service. A Gitly is where we store all of the Git repositories. Uh, so we, we get that fairly frequently. It's not a big deal. Again, we just expand the disks and everything's sorted. But this is already giving us a lot of value. Um, so, just some points in wrapping up. Um, so, really what we're trying to build here is like an early warning system, and what we want to do is, is rank potential problems from the worst potential risk to uh, down from there, so that we can prioritize up upcoming work, feed this into our roadmap, and, and, and avoid problems before they become a big issue. Now, at GitLab, one of our values is dog fooding, and uh, you know everything we do has to go back into the product. Uh, you know, Sid, our CEO, is always saying, "If you need it, other people need it." So we have this very, very strong dog dog fooding culture, and so a lot of what we're doing here will make its way back into the product. But we're kind of iterating on it very quickly on GitLab.com, and you know, in the next few months, the product will have this built in. And the plan there is that system administrators and support engineers can look at these graphs and they can say, you know, you really need to start thinking about like upgrading your Redis or whatever it is. And so this will be going into the, the product at some point. And then finally, this is early days, like, you know, there's still a lot of uh, improvements that we can make, but it is adding a huge amount of value for us already. Um, and so if you've got any input or any thoughts, like I'd love to hear from you, so please get in touch. And that's it. Thank you very much. Oh, this repository is where we keep all of our run books, all of our Prometheus recording rules, uh, all of our Grafana dashboards. We're moving across to um, Graphonet, which is a, a, a language for writing Grafana dashboards. So if you want to see any of that stuff, it's, it's all in there. So please take a look. Thank you very much. <laughs> cool. Do we do questions? Or? Yeah. yeah. Does anyone have any questions? Yes. Um, you have these uh, resource saturation percentages, um, but when you started out, there was kind of that special case of like uh, you're only using uh, 
you have 67% of the CPU free because it only used one thread. Do you think yeah. there's kind of a, I mean, I saw later you had then a resource usage for a single core. Do you think there's kind of like a, some kind of general rule you could apply so that you <laughs> are measuring these things? Like, like we have, we have two, we, for, for single threaded services, we have one rule, which is like, um, what's the worst core in the system? Um, and like, if possible, we actually measure it on the on the process that's single threaded. So, on Redis, we use, Redis has its own metrics for for doing that. Like Redis uses CPU seconds total, something like that. And we we read that uh, we use that because we trust it more than the the general one. At the moment, for um, uh, PG Balancer, which is also single threaded, we use just the general. We say like, what's the worst? or what's the most utilized core? And we can apply that across like all single threaded services. But what we found is that it doesn't, it's not actually a very good indicator. Um, so we're moving across to, uh, we're gonna start recording it in, in process exporter, which is uh, like a Prometheus exporter that monitors particular services. And we will we'll use that. So basically we found that like a general rule doesn't work very well. I don't know if I've answered your question. Cool. Any more questions? Well, good. Okay. Cool. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you.